Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online.
I'm Dan Rundy. Thanks for joining us today at CSIS for a conversation called Cooperation or Competition, Planning for the Next National Security Strategy. Uh, the past few years have seen unprecedented challenges for the United States and its partners from a once in a generation global pandemic that resulted in the loss of lives, livelihoods and global supply chain stability to a continued and accelerated backsliding of democracy. State actors who have malign interests towards the United States, such as China, Iran, and Russia, are at the heart of any number of global issues as they become increasingly belligerent. In particular, the focus is on China and Russia, which are furthering their authoritarian agendas by growing their military, economic, and digital prowess. The last four years have also seen dramatic vacillations in how the United States responds to these evolving strategic competitors. That vacillation has reached an inflection point with the advent of the national security strategy process. Under the Goldwater-Nichols Act, the President of the United States must submit an annual report on the national security strategy of the United States to Congress. The Biden-Harris administration announced the kickoff of that process in early February. Now it's the hard part, defining strategic and security priorities for the United States, including where to cooperate and where to compete. I'm really so pleased to be doing this with my colleague, Seth Jones, who's a senior vice president at CSIS and runs the International Security Program. We have two really great experts who are gonna help us uh, unpack this. We have uh, Dr. Nadia Shadlow, who was most recently U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategy. She was one of the authors of the 2017 National Security Strategy. Um, she's known to many of us. Uh, prior to that, she was a Senior Program Officer for International Security and Foreign Policy Program at the Smith Richardson Foundation. She's currently a Senior Fellow at the Hudson Institute. We also have our, our, an, an amigo de la casa, a friend of the house, uh, Jim Steinberg, who is a university professor of social science, international affairs, and law at Syracuse University, where he was the dean of the Maxwell School from July 2011 until June 2016. CSIS is really proud and happy with its partnership with the Maxwell School, and uh, Jim Steinberg and his colleagues at the Maxwell School have been our great partners, and we value our partnership with them. Prior to becoming dean, he served as deputy secretary of state uh, the principal deputy to Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton from 2009 to 2011. Uh, prior to that, he was the dean of the Lyndon Johnson School of Public Affairs, and he's had a, a wonderful career at the Brookings Institution. He also had a wonderful career in government as well. So we've got the right folks to help us uh, unpack this and, and look at these issues. Um, I, we've got a number of questions to, to take on, but why don't I stop there and I'm going to turn the floor over to my friend and colleague, Seth Jones. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for, for organizing this. Uh, it's great to do this event with you and it's great to do it with, uh, with Jim and Nadia, two experts with extensive experience. Let me just give you my take. Uh, this is in part based on a book that comes out later this year uh, with W.W. W. Norton that looks at this issue of competition. And you know, as we as we talk about the issue of cooperation and competition, in part under the interim national security strategic guidance that the Biden administration has already put out, I I wanted to give my take, and um, I think what's important from my perspective is to lay out that I see this more of a competitive than a cooperative uh, endeavor, and and why do I say that? And these aren't entirely black or white concepts. But I think at the core issue here is one of the core issues is that we have very different types of political and economic systems. You could expand that to social cultural systems. But I think in particular, political and economic systems between the United States and a range of countries like China, Russia, Iran, and even North Korea. And in, in many ways, you know, they, these are authoritarian regimes. They're illiberal. Um, their systems are antithetical to Western Enlightenment values. They generally view the United States as their primary adversary. Um, and then competition to a great extent along these lines is a struggle over ideologies and, and systems. And I think that, that obviously impacts 
uh, the, the norms and the rules of major international organizations, non-governmental uh, non -governmental organizations, and security organizations. But I do think it's worth noting that it's not entirely a zero sum game. It's worth pointing out even at the height of the Cold War uh, with uh, Ronald Reagan and Gorbachev, they reached a historic arms control agreement. And, and I think in that sense, what we see is there are likely going to be avenues for cooperation and it may, may include issues like global warming, uh, certainly some aspects of the economic system. I mean, I think it's worth noting, unlike the Soviet Union, China's, uh, China's economy is much more intertwined with uh, the global economic system than the Soviet economy ever was. Uh, its population of 1.4 billion is an attractive market for U.S. companies. It boasts 400 million millennials. I'm going to say that one more time. 400 million millennials, five times the number as the U.S. And so I think, you know, there will be important avenues for economic trade, uh, energy markets that I think make this not entirely a zero sum game. But I, I think as, as we look at U.S. national security strategy, I'm going to talk briefly about five issues that I think lie at the core, core of this. These aren't the only issues, but five that I do want to highlight. One is, um, is that I, I think any U.S. strategy moving forward has to be based on U.S. core principles that have been at the core of U.S. policy really since the founding. And that is the democratic nature of the US government, the commitment to an open economic system and free trade, as well as the ability of people around the world uh, to get access to information. And I think that does put the US on a collision course to some degree with countries that attempt to establish a great firewall to their own populations, a halal internet, or the Russian version, the, the run net, that ban websites and information that flows uh, to their countries. Uh, there may be very different views of human rights. And I mean, we certainly see this with the Chinese treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. I think at the core of this is a recognition that there are different guiding principles and systems uh, that make this a competitive landscape. And they, I think they impact various aspects. So that's one. Second, I do think one of the areas where the U.S. has been very far behind is uh, what B.H. Littleheart, the British military strategist, uh, described in a conversation with the uh, uh, Irish, uh, it was a conversation he described between the, the Irish statesman John Wilson Croker and Arthur Wellesley, who was the first Duke of Wellington. He called it the, uh, the other side of the hill. And I think we've got a very... Uh, we've done a very poor job of, 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 of understanding what is going on on the other side of the hill. I think it's particularly true with the Chinese, where you know, the Chinese have spent vast amounts of, of money uh, uh, translating materials from English into Mandarin, uh, understanding what, what, uh, what is being discussed in the U.S., both vulnerabilities and weaknesses, and it puts the U.S. at a disadvantage right now. I mean, it's worth noting that the largest Chinese newspaper is a translation of foreign news. Uh, we have no equivalent in the United States. In fact, I think if you look at uh, the amounts of money that China has poured into the language training program, um, the amount of money uh, that, uh, that they've poured into information operations, they call it the three warfares, staggering compared to uh, what the U.S. has put together. I mean, it really, I, I think George Kennan would have been appalled at how little Americans understand uh, China, in part because, you know, we've got no, we've not, we've, we, we've got no foreign broadcast information service or anything along those lines um, anymore. The U.S. closed down any outside public access to the open source enterprise, which was the which is the successor of the Foreign Broadcast Information Service in 2019. And I think there needs to be a much broader, substantial effort to understand these countries. Uh, and that requires some funding. Uh, I think where, where, where we were in part with the Soviets. So that's number two. The third is, and I'm just gonna hit on this really briefly. I think 
we cannot mirror image as we look at strategy. Uh, what is with, with such a focus on the US Department of Defense uh, an obsession with conventional or nuclear war. And when I look at you know, the O plans in the Department of Defense, the, the classified planning scenarios, that's about Baltic state scenario with the Russians, a fight with the Russians in the Baltic uh, states. It's about a South China Sea or Taiwan Strait scenario that's conventional or even a nuclear war. And I think when you look at this, this, this is sort of where we were with a full to gap in, Germ in, in, uh, in the inter-German period, uh, in, in inter-German geographic uh, uh, area. I, I think when you actually look at what the Russians and the Chinese, even the Iranians are doing, uh, and, and the North Koreans to some degree, is putting a lot of emphasis on what you might call irregular and asymmetric gray zone uh, uh, tactics and strategy. So I think part of our strategy has to understand its offensive cyber operations that these countries are conducting. Russian activities in Africa are heavily focused on the expansion of Russian private military companies like the Wagner Group. Uh, in the, in the, uh, sustained Russian operations in Syria, they leveraged uh, Lebanese Hezbollah as a major ground component. So they've, they're using those in the expansion of power. So I think there, there has to be a, a much more significant recognition of the asymmetric irregular gray zone aspect of competition. The fourth thing, and I'll, and I'll be brief in these final two areas. The fourth thing is um, I do think it's not just about defensive information, but I think we need to think systematically about what offensive information looks like. Um, and I think, you know, the, the Cold War equivalent is the use of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty uh, against uh, adversaries in West, in Eastern Europe and in the former Soviet Union. What, what kinds of issues and how are we going to communicate that, whether it's to those that are pushing for democracy in Hong Kong or in other areas of the world, the, the struggle that Navalny is leading in Russia right now for uh, democracy. How are we gonna do this? And how are we gonna, what kinds of activities are we gonna support? This is not just defensive. I think there is an, there's an offensive uh, component to that. I'm not talking about by military force or necessarily covert action, but I am talking about finding ways to push, and I'm not even talking about using the barrel of a gun, but push US uh, uh, values, uh, especially in, in protecting individuals that are also supporting it. And then the fifth element is really um, the support of allies and partners. And I, and I think this struggle, one can see it in 5G, one can see it in, uh, in the condemnation of human rights abuses, whether it's Chinese or, or whether it's uh, uh, Putin and the, the focus on pressuring uh, dissidents or the offensive cyber operations or assassinations in countries like the UK. It's to get back to the support. So I think all five of those, Dan, are important parts of, of, of what our national security strategy uh, should include. But again, I see this really as a competition in part over political, economic, and other systems. And I actually think it's inevitable. Uh, if we're true to who we are, that we will clash in part over different ideologies. And, uh, and so, you know, again, not entirely zero sum, I, I get it, uh, but I, I think that's kind of the world we live in as I see it. So with that, I will turn this over to Nadia. Sorry, Nadia, before you, I just wanna make, I encourage our audience to use the link on our event page at CSIS.org to leave us your questions, which we can then share with our, our the panelists uh, as the conversation progresses. Sorry, sorry about that, Seth. Nadia, over to you. No, thank, thanks so much, Seth and, and, and Dan. Um, so not to, you know, I actually agree uh, with much of what Seth has, has laid out and some of the foundational elements we need to think about. Where I might differ a little bit is that I think actually both the Trump national security strategy and the Biden interim one are actually have, have at least on paper addressed some of these concerns, which is the nature of competition. Uh, the Biden strategy articulates a view of sort of hybrid gray zone. The Trump strategy discussed the competition continuum, which was neither peace and neither war. So I think we've made some progress on some of the areas. Uh, but going back to sort of how I'll frame my remarks. So I think Seth laid out five points. I'm gonna lay out initially four points that I, I think are still relevant uh, to the current situation that we're facing. 
Uh, these are kind of the four assumptions of the 2017 NSS. The first one, which I think um, the, the current administration will agree with, is that China had not been a responsible stakeholder since its accession to the World Trade Organization in 2001, and that our hopes uh, that China would become a responsible stakeholder no longer held, that that had been an illusion and we needed to understand that. So that was one of the key assumptions of the 2017 NSS. A second was that political liberalization and the growth of transnational organizations had not tempered rivalries among states, that these competitions are still going on in these multilateral organizations um, as well as, as, as other places. And political liberalization, this convergence into democracy, sort of the end of history argument hadn't really happened. Thus the basis for the idea of a, this being a competitive world. Uh, third, the, the 2017 strategy challenged the assumption that globalization was an unmitigated good, right? This had been percolating, but it put it out there front and center and said there were a lot of losers to globalization, including all the manufacturing uh, centers in the United States, all those who had lost jobs around the world, and that China had actually used uh, globalization and some of its some, some of the trade relationships to create its own supply chain verticals, which we can talk about uh, separately. And fourth, it sort of raised the idea that technologies weren't necessarily in the service of democracies. There had been this period of hope during the Clinton administrations, during the Bush administrations, that these digital technologies would liberalize and would advance freedom and democracy would flourish. And we saw now that actually probably the authoritarians are winning now in terms of uh, the use of technologies to surveil, to control, and that's only seems to be getting worse and worse. So I think those four assumptions from the 2017 National Security Strategy still hold. Now I'm not sure you know, if Jim and Seth will agree. I think many of them, several of them are in fact in the Biden administration's interim uh, national security guidance, but not all of them. So I wanted to just for the sake of conversation, uh, throw out some areas where I, I think there might be some differences. First, um, where? First, I think the Biden administration, and this is in their interim guidance, still has a tendency to place multilateralism, transnationalism ab above sovereignty, right? A sense that these are big challenges happening. They are unfolding sort of amorphously. Um, you know, e everything from pandemics to climate to cyber to digital. So I think a different view of that is that states are behind all of those things. States push those things. These are not amorphous developments. These are developments pushed by state for varying reasons who have different agendas. They don't just happen or unfold. And I think the interim NSS, you know, sort of has that, uh, has a different view. A second view is that if uh, the Biden NSS says, which I really like, his emphasis on the importance of showing that democracies work, right? I think that's really important and I agree with him but I think there's still gonna be a tendency to fall back on old institutions and old approaches to these new sets of problems. I see little evidence that they're going to be new approaches. And I think, I know this will be controversial, but that's probably why you had me on, Dan. I think a good example would have been to hold back on the decision to rejoin the WHO. We now have no leverage at all to get reforms and we have to explain to the American people and to many others around the world why after 25 years, the WHO has not been able to reform. I think it actually would have been a good opportunity to, to take um, the interim NSS approach of rethinking these institutions, revitalizing them, and actually using a real world, real time example to do that. Again, not everyone's gonna like that, but throwing it out there. Third, I think the Biden um, NSS, the interim NSS, um, I think cooperation with China will just be harder than it thinks. And I think there are probably different views within the administration on this. So there's the, we can compartmentalize view. And I think there are others who probably realize it's going to be a lot harder. It's just gonna be a lot harder. Cooperation with China is not like cooperation with the United Kingdom. It's not going to be the same. Um, China has leverage over key areas, uh, renewables being one, and climate. So the Biden administration's climate agenda, which depends upon batteries, right, because you need batteries to store renewable energy and you need batteries to run electrical vehicles. The ent entire supply chain is dominated by China. 
And to think that it won't use that leverage, I think is, you know, I think is a bit off. Again, I think these are now being debated within the administration and you do see an emphasis on the need to think about supply chains differently. But I think that's um, another point. Fourth, I think um, they'll need to think about this. What I see, what some critics see is the delinking of military power from diplomatic and economic. Now that might be, you know, un unfair. We'll see what happens. This is interim guidance, but I think it's, um, meaningful that sort of the peace through strength idea, the idea that military power undergirds political and economic power uh, was not there. And that's one that wasn't just a Trump administration idea. It's been there, you know, in American history through different administrations. So I think there'll be pressure among different camps in the Biden administration to think about the role of military power. Uh, and um, and I don't think you can delink the three. I think they're they're intertwined. Uh, fifth, more specifically, and then I'll end there, is uh, you do see a difference in terms of some of the nuclear modernization issues. And maybe this is a sub, a sub point to the fourth point about military power, but that was also notable in the interim NSS. I think there is going to be much more of a debate about nuclear modernization um, than there was in the, in the Trump administration. And that in turn is important because that is a key part of great power competition and how, uh, how we see that competition unfolding. So those are some of the areas where, you know, if I was the, the question of this uh, seminar was initially planning the next NSS. Um, I think the four assumptions of the 2017 strategy still hold. I don't think the interim strategic guidance agrees with all of them, but, but, there, but there's a fair amount of agreement as well, but it will come down to really how, um, how decisions are taken to get things done. And if, as I said, the Biden administration wants to emphasize how well democracies work, I think there's going to be an in inevitable clash um, with this emphasis on multilateralism, almost at, to the extent of everything. And I especially liked, uh, you know, I liked your point, Seth, and I'll end, you know, if we're true to who we are, we will clash with others. And that actually is with our allies as well. We are not always going to agree with our allies. Um, and we are going to see that and managing that process um, will be interesting. So thanks very much. Thank you, Nadia. Thanks very much. Jim Steinberg, please. Thank you. And let me begin by thanking you and Seth and um, CSIS, as you mentioned, this great partnership we've had between Maxwell and CSIS, and especially this uh, joint executive master's program in international relations that we're doing, a number of you are teaching in. Uh, it's really bringing together the world of the academy and the world of practice at one of the great think tanks in the world. So uh, just been a great pleasure and hope many of you will think about uh, joining us in that. Um, so Seth had five points, Nadi had four assumptions, and I have three axes. Um, I think as we think about national security in 2021, there are three axes that are around which we have to organize uh, our national security uh, strategy, and they are and they're at integrate. The first is what Nadia has emphasized, which is the sort of the traditional competition rivalry tensions between states. And we certainly, I think, have seen over the last several decades that any hope that that would sort of disappear with the end of the Cold War has not disappeared. States are central and especially large states, which have interests which are different than ours and sometimes adversarial to ours, are increasingly important in the international system and are at the front and center of the challenges that we face today. A lot of focus on China, we'll talk about China, but I wanna generally say that there is a kind of traditional set of foreign policy challenges that involve China and Russia and Iran and North Korea and the like, and they persist and they are, they are part of what we have to organize a strategy around. But at the same time, the second axis are these emerging transnational issues, the global issues like climate change, public health, uh, the revolution in biology with all the good and bad that it's going to bring with it, cyber and the like. And these are very different kinds of challenges, uh, require different ways of thinking, different ways of operating, and different ways of working with other countries. Because the, the reality is, is though the states certainly have a role in creating these problems and a role in creating solutions, no state by itself can solve these. And we have to find ways to develop the institutions and arrangements that can manage these transnational problems. And we have at a severe deficit today in our capacity to do this. And we have not evolved the right kinds of arrangements to handle it. And these are truly the existential threats that we face. And if that weren't true before, wasn't obvious before COVID, it sure ought to be obvious uh, today. But the third axis is back home in the United States and the need for national rejuvenation because our strength and ability to carry out our national security strategy depends 
fundamentally on our strength at home, on our economy, on our political system, on our uh, sense of, of common objectives and purposes. And that, as much as dealing with the problems of, of uh, rival states or dealing with international problems, has got to be at the core of our national security strategy. In order to be effective, in order to promote our interests in the world, we have to have the capacity at home. We have to invest in our people, in our infrastructure, in our ability to innovate, uh, to create uh, new knowledge, uh, to lead the way as we have uh, in the past. And in some ways, our ability to count out any of the other aspects or, or, or be successful in the other two axes depends on our success in the latter. And I think that one of the great strengths of the Biden administration's interim guidance, which I think is a very important document and very valuable document, and they should get a lot of credit for putting it out, putting it out early so we have some sense about where they're going even before the laborious process of writing a full up national security strategy, which as Nadia knows well is a, is a laborious and, and, and challenging process. Um, you know, it, the fact that, that that has been so centrally identified as part of the national security strategy, I think is one of the great strengths of this because at the end of the day, um, we have a competition with China, with others. Uh, if we're gonna succeed, it's not gonna be by hobbling the opponent. It's gonna be by training better, being better prepared, being more able and more capable uh, than anybody else. And we have inherent resources because of our democracy, because of the openness of our society, because of, as Seth said, who we are, that we have every reason to think that we would prevail. Every reason to think that if we draw on and build and invest in our, our own resources, and that's not only the surest way for us to be strong and effective, but it's also the best way for us to reassure our partners around the world that we're capable of providing the kind of leadership that they are looking for uh, from the United States. And that's why the, the experience with COVID has been damaging for the United States, because it has called into question our own ability to handle these challenges. And I think a, an honest assessment of the fact that our power comes to some extent, not a yes from the military, but also from the success of our democracy, as Seth said. And that success means managing the 21st century challenges, showing that we can be the most innovative, most productive, um, most uh, successful society is what's going to lead people to support us because they see that this is a way that works and will lead us to follow in the same path in the competition that Seth talked about, about different models of governance. So that for me really is the key. And so we have to take on the challenges of the great power rivalries. But for me at the center of the big challenges are finding new ways and more effective ways to deal with international cooperation, to deal with the transnational challenges and to restore our own strength at home uh, to be ready for the match. Great, okay, thanks very much. Could I ask each of you if I said the word Russia to each of you just to say, what if I say to you we're Russia, what's your response to that in terms of the context of the national security strategy? Nadia, can I start with you? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll be quick. I think the strategy um, identified, well, the strategy did identify Russia as a revisionist power, meaning a power that wanted to change the status quo, that wanted to be disruptive, um, and that didn't want to um, abide by the values of the international order. So I think I think we, we've seen that. Um, it's obviously a different kind of challenge than Russia, right? The, the 2017 strategy said that China competes effectively across all, all domains, economic, political, military, technological, all of those accelerated by technology acknowledged that Russia was more disruptive in its approach, but it can be quite disruptive. And remember, Russia still poses an existential threat to the United States because of its nuclear arsenal. So um, I think in that sense, the interim guidance, but I'll let Jim and uh, Seth talk to that. I think it's probably a pretty similar view. It's interesting to me. I mean, Russia's got the economy. It's got a hundred plus million people, and it's got the GMP of Spain, and it causes so much, so much trouble. If I can describe it that way, Jim. Uh, it does cause trouble. Um, you know, I think that uh, as Nadia said, it's it, it has a, a particular set of objectives. I mean, its first objective is, is to keep Putin in power. I mean, that's its dominant project, objective. Its second is to uh, maximize its influence in the areas around it, uh, which it has always seen as sort of at the core of the way it wants to achieve its security rather than cooperating with others. It wants to dominate everybody else around it. And three, it wants to try to uh, hamper the influence of the United States and its partners in the international system. 
Each of these things are problematic from our point of view. The first is problematic on the value side because you know, Putin is, a, is an authoritarian who you know, that we've seen in very dramatic ways, just how, how he treats the political system, human rights and the like. A second, his desire to achieve Russia's security at the expense of his neighbors is fundamentally inconsistent with the UN Charter and all the principles that we believe in, that everybody should have a right to make their own decisions. And then finally, its disruptive role in international organizations and, and trying to impede others' agendas is a problem for us. So across the board, we have a set of issues with Russia. And you know, we have to just be honest with them that, that this is that there are these are fundamental differences and that we're not going to simply try to accommodate them. I know there's been a lot of discussion in the in the, the talking classes about well, maybe we could join up with Russia against China. And it's certainly a problem for us that Russia and China are working together. But what it would take to placate uh, Putin and Russia to get them on our side, I think would be so fundamentally against our interests that we have to be prepared to deal with both of them as problems for the United States. Seth, if I say Russia and the national security strategy, what's your reaction to that? I think what uh, Russia has done is played a weak hand relatively well. Um, I, you know, as you noted, Dan, their economy is relatively weak. Uh, kind of mid-tier European at best, uh, certainly not in the great power status. But I think what, what we see in 2014 in Crimea and then in Eastern Ukraine and then in Syria and then in, in Africa and then even in Venezuela, it, it, and then if you add the, the cyber dimension and the espionage component, what they've done, I think, is use asymmetric, irregular activities that aren't particularly expensive, that don't necessarily cost large amounts of money but to attempt to um, create or at least sow additional discord in the United States, attempt to meddle in the elections, expand uh, power again in the Middle East, not through what they did during the Cold War, which is deploying large numbers of conventional forces into Afghanistan, but really uh, using strikes from caliber cruise missiles off of maritime platforms and airstrikes uh, from fixed wing aircraft and basically get somebody else to do the fighting on the ground. Syrians, the uh, Lebanese Hezbollah, uh, some of the Palestinian Iraqi militia on the ground. And then where we've seen them active in Mozambique, Central African Republic, Libya, it's GRU, SVR, Wagner Group, and, and other private military companies. So, you know, in that sense, they've done a reasonable job, I think, at expanding their influence, meddling in, in the U.S., without a huge economy. So this does bring me, Dan, if I can, just for a second, come back to one of Jim's points, because I think Jim did hit uh, one issue uh, that I think is really important, which is uh, the US national security, says security strategy, Nadia said this to some degree as well, uh, needs to, to begin at least in part with strength at home. But I think what we've seen in the last couple of years is competition is intense at home. And, and I, I think, you know, it's worth noting Chinese influence in the NBA, in Hollywood, including how Hollywood companies are, are, are think, thinking and studios are thinking about, you know, what, what issues they cover and how they deal with China because they've got to export uh, to the Chinese market. Uh, if you look at the espionage, the Confucius Institutes at, in the United States, the Thousand Talents Program, the disinformation campaigns we've seen in the United States during COVID um, from the Chinese and the Russians is that competition is also a significant issue inside of the U.S., I think at levels that we did not see in the Cold War. And I, I think that makes this a little bit different. So strength at home, certainly agree with, but I would just push back a little bit to note that, uh, that, that this it's a contested ground right now. Let me try another topic. In the interim guidance, there was discussion of domestic violent extremism uh, and it's the challenges that they pose to our core democratic principles and our ability to even promote these principles. I think Jim, you referred to getting our house in order as one of the axes. Can I ask each of you to talk about this issue of how we manage or confront or how do you think the strategy will we'll discuss or think about this issue of domestic violent extremism. Let me start actually with you, Seth. You wrote a report, I think, that talks about this. 
Yeah, Dan, we're releasing another one Monday with updated data through the end of January 2021. I mean, I would say this is it's 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 often characterized the, the phenomenon is often characterized as domestic terrorism. And I think what we see increasingly, both physically, but also in terms of the internet and digital platforms, is it is almost anything but domestic. The there is a lot of extremism and cross-pollination between extremists in the US and, and in Europe or New Zealand or Australia. If you look at uh, some of the, the main significant groups the FBI has arrested, individuals from Adam Waffen Division or the base, they, are, they have nodes in other countries. In fact, the head of the base, ironically, is, uh, is uh, still believed to be uh, in Russia right now, which, which also gives you a sense of how competition has impacted um, the uh, extremism uh, landscape. But I, I think this is, a, this is an increasingly notable issue that our data shows, this uh, CSIS data shows that in tw 2020 had the highest level since our data set began in the 1990s of uh, terrorist attacks and plots in the US. Not fatalities, but attacks and plots since our data set started in about 1994, which was you know, around the time of the Timothy McVeigh attack. So this is a serious issue. And this is one to watch in the sense of competition because we've seen the Russians in particular uh, have attempted through some of their intelligence uh, organizations like the GRU and the SVR to, to, to try to promote additional discord um, especially with some of the white supremacist organizations. Uh, they have attempted to expand the reach, um, uh, echo the messages that we've seen from digital platforms. And there has certainly been training in Eastern Ukraine of extremists coming from Germany, many of which we see cooperate with, uh, with uh, extremists in the US. So it's a serious problem, but it is increasingly an international one. Jim, could I ask you to comment? Sure, I'll we'll assess the expert, uh, but I do think we have to worry about the domestic uh, basis of these. And I have no doubt that there are outsiders who were interested in promoting it, but I think all of us who watched what happened in the Capitol have to be concerned about what's happening here at home. And it does affect us abroad. I think nobody would have expected to see a scene like that in the United States is what we expect to see in other countries. And it does, have an impact. And I think that one of the things that we, is our strength is that we can admit our flaws. And I think that that's really the, the starting point here is to recognize that we are an imperfect society and we have problems here at home that we have to deal with. But we also can't just say that, we have to deal with it. And we have to show a determination to say that while there are deep fissures and polarization politically in this country, that there are, there are civic and civil ways to do that and not to, to resort to violence. And I think that is the thing that has been shaking us at home and influencing people's opinions of us abroad is to see this, what is it, legitimately heated political debate and, and fair, right? We have fundamental differences across the polity in our country about core issues about how the country should be run, but um, it is damaging to us in our own democracy and damaging us to the perception of our democracy if we can't find ways to come together, especially in a cross-party way, uh, to try to marginalize these violent disagreements and confine the disagreements to the political space. Nadia? Yeah, I'll just add, I mean, I think Seth's point about, uh, you know, I'm not an expert on these issues, but I think as in any threats, internal or external, we actually need to know numbers. Uh, we need to know sources. We need actual specifics. So I haven't seen the last report, Seth, but I would be curious to know the changes in absolute numbers from 94 to today, because I think today the media, which has a, uh, you know, it's, it's a highly politicized and I would say generally not constructive media tends to use large uh, you know, statements. So you don't have any sense of what has changed. What are the numbers? And I think our rule of law system, I think our system uh, can, can protect Americans from threats that exist. We have a rule of law system if it's applied fairly and honestly across the board. I think that it's, it's sufficient, um, but we do need to understand uh, what we're facing in a specific way, right? You can't train for a threat. You can't 
a resource a threat. You can't identify the capabilities you need to deal with a threat unless we actually start talking about quite specific numbers and putting them in context. Got it. Okay, how about um, the word that- but, but actually I would like to know, I mean, Seth, I mean, could you, what What yeah. are the, we are, I mean, because I think that's, that's a really important point. If Let's the report, maybe news. you don't have it off the top of your head, but send, you know, send a link out to all of us so that we can read the report that presumably, you know, has, understands actually the numbers, uh, the locale, where, where these problems are occurring around the country. Not at 9.30 Monday morning, we are going live uh, with, uh, with the, uh, it's, we've kept it a relatively short report. Uh, it's got the data in there. Uh, we can, anybody that's interested in seeing the underlying Excel spreadsheets, uh, welcome to, to see it. Um, and I, I would say, you know, one thing that's, that, that is in, that's useful to note about this, well, there are two things. One is that the fatality levels are actually relatively low. So the attacks right now aren't killing large numbers of people, which is an important caveat. And second, the U.S. history of dealing with this has been, it's been pretty effective, FBI and law enforcement, in, uh, in eventually putting its focus on threats inside of the country and penetrating them and taking them down. We're just at a point where uh, I, I think the numbers of those inspired by Al Qaeda and the Islamic State are really low right now. So the shift has got to be on where we see the threats, such as the white supremacists, uh, some of the anti-fascists and anarchists, and some of the 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 uh, anti-government militia, Boogaloo boys that have they're hard to characterize in any in any term, but are but have conducted attacks against law enforcement. In fact, that's one of the interesting things is we're seeing individuals from all sides of the political spectrum. By the end of 2020, we're targeting police, uh, far right, far left, everybody uh, for 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 various reasons. But the history of dealing with it in the U.S. is is a is a good news story. Okay. All right. Let me try something else. Allies. How are we going to do? How is how is the national security strategy going to think about allies? I think we've seen a, an increased interest in the last couple of months on the quad, um, but obviously we've you know we've historically had great uh, relations with you know the, certain allies have been an important part of our various strategies we've had. I suspect there's not going to be a lot of change, but I'd welcome thoughts about the issue of allies and in this national security strategy. Jim, why don't I start with you? Great. Well, I you know I I think it's probably a shared view that. Uh, we have many strengths, but one of our greatest strengths is we have allies and the others don't. Um, they have a, a few countries that are beholden to them, but I think very few countries can really consider themselves the allies of either China or Russia. They sometimes don't have a lot of choice. In a country like Cambodia, you may feel you don't have a lot of choice, but, but we, have, we have friends by choice, not by coercion. And they are incredibly valuable in every respect. They, military capability, they gave us access to the, the whole world, they are critical economic partners and they, they multiply the values that Seth talked about because they demonstrate that the values that we believe in are not confined to the United States or North America or the North Atlantic, but there, there's vibrant democracies in Taiwan and, and Japan and South Korea and, and, and in Africa and the Middle East. And, and so, you know, this is, this is the universality of our message. So it's absolutely essential. I mean, both to deal with the traditional foreign policy problems that I started my first axis and to deal with the emerging problems of transnational problems. Because if we want to develop transnational strategies, the easiest way to do that is to work with like-minded states to develop a program. And that gives us a solid core that we can then use to bring that to the wider international audience. So I, I think as the strategy uh, the guidance makes clear, this has got to be at the heart and soul of what we do and recognize that these are partnerships and we can't just tell them what to do. We have to listen to them as well, but that we need them, they need us. And together we are going to be a very formidable force in shaping the future world order. Now, you wanna comment on this issue of allies? Of course, I completely agree with Jim that allies are, and partners, I would say, right? Cause depending on how you define allies, not everyone is in a binding <laughs> alliance as a NATO are a very important competitive advantage that the United States has. Uh, but we can't elevate the process of talking to allies, the process of talking to allies to achieving outcomes, right? And to achieve outcomes that we want, whether it's uh, to deter militarily or whether it's to improve the lives of, you know, of, of uh, refugees around the world. 
at a certain point, we need to figure out the coalitions, the coalitions of the willing, the countries most uh, that most agree on the on the on the problem, the diagnosis of the problem, and those willing to solve it. So, if we continue to do the same thing over and over, uh, elevating process over new approaches to getting uh, to the outcomes we want, I think we will increase cynicism, we will reduce confidence in democracies, and we will weaken our alliances because they just won't get things done. So I think we're seeing a shift toward, you know, coalitions of the willing, D10, D7. I think we need to be flexible about that. And sometimes it needs to be smaller. And Dan, just to challenge, not, you know, but the Trump administration elevated the quad. Um, it was built on, and the Biden administration, you know, a great thing in their first, I don't know what, it was March, so first however many days, you know, had this incredibly important summit of the four quad leaders, which is really important. But the quad had been elevated previously, and building on that is is just as important as 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 sort of um, traditional partnerships. I mean, that's sort of a- No, no, thank, thank you for correcting yeah. me. That's right. It was, I guess, invented in the Bush administration, kind of was quiescent Obama was elevated in Trump and has now been taken to another level in Biden. Right. Dan, Dan, can, I, can I come back on yes. this? Just we have a little back and forth. And first of all, I agree with that. Trump I'm, I'm gonna come in after, uh, I'm gonna disagree too a little bit. Okay, because um, you know I, I get the coalitions of the willing, okay? but we went through this with, with Secretary Rumsfeld, which is that if you tell your, your friends and allies, well, we're with you if you agree with us, but if you don't agree with us, we'll go find somebody else to work with. And, and, and rather than try to find a way to find common ground, it's just, we're gonna do it our way and we'll, go, we'll work with whoever everybody agrees with us. You're not gonna have allies for the long term. And so it's certainly true that you don't have to have the same group of every time, you don't have to work with everybody else. But I do think that there's a reason why enduring alliances, especially the transatlantic alliance or alliance with Japan, is things that we say, you know, when we have differences, rather than just say, well, we can't work it out, we'll go find somebody else, that we do try to find ways to work together. And I think it is an approach to alliances, which means that we are, are willing to find, you know, a, a way of, of coming together around things rather than simply saying, well, we're going to just have a pickup game every time uh, we have a new set of issues. So. There can be new organizations to deal with new problems where there's a new set of countries that are relevant, like the, the M10 and dealing with climate. I, I certainly agree with that. But I, I do worry about this idea of this, we're just going to use coalitions for the book because it's easier to get everybody on board for the outcome. I, I, yeah, I understand your concern. I think the pickup game analogy is good, um, but that's not entirely the characterization, you know, that essentially there are tough problems that we're going to be facing and we might all in this policy community be better off moving from the the headlines of do more with allies and partners to actually the specific problem sets that we're facing right so saying that we want to do more with allies and partners at this point is 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 just trite everyone says it everyone uses it let's specifically talk about the problems germany pipeline russia the Biden administration has been very concerned about Germany. So what does that mean for NATO? I think there are plenty of specific areas that we can start to talk about, you know, now that that um, the complaints about the previous administration, you know, we can't we can't focus on those complaints anymore. We need to look forward and figure out how we can work on these issues and have our allies contribute in kind um, in, in, in capabilities and in, re in financial resources as well. And I, I want to I want to I want to pick up on this point a little bit because I think I, I do think it's it's certainly one level to talk about the importance of allies and partners, including the NATO ones. But I think we also have to have a continue to have a frank discussion about what they are capable and what we are capable of and what they're not. And I think if you look, just to give an example on the military side, um, the direction over the next seven to eight years that European mili militaries are going in, and this includes the French and the British, is they are not, they are not likely to be major players in large scale combat or even you know, some of the major uh, crisis management operations. They do not have heavy maneuver forces. The Germans are cutting them back. They don't have a lot of naval combatants support capabilities like logistics and fire support still huge problems with aerial refueling and transport. So, you know, NATO has been talking a lot more about coordination on dealing with China. Well, first of all, there are huge political will discussions. A, a recent German uh, report, um, public opinion report noted 
Germans in general are not going to side with the U.S. against the Chinese. You know, and again, this is a context specific public opinion poll. So, you know, differences in views along these lines. But I think it's sort of worth highlighting uh, that there are some huge and, and these aren't just it's not the just not just the two percent debate. You know, what percent of uh, European GDPs are they putting towards defense? Wales wanted two percent. You know, we see the Germans increase by 34 percent, but they're still way below. This is about their ability to to perform key missions. And I think that's where we're seeing still huge challenges. Any of the Baltic scenarios, South China Sea, Taiwan Strait scenarios, Iran scenarios in the Persian Gulf, they're just not that capable at the high end. And I don't I don't see a lot of change. We have to have a frank conversation about what many European countries can and cannot do even under the NATO con construct. So part of the issue is, I think, also a frank discussion on where we're at and what we can expect uh, of, of our allies and partners. Okay. Uh, the issue of burden sharing has been with us since I think the Eisenhower administration. I wrote an article. There was significant increases in spending in the Trump administration and getting allies to spend more. Um, but this has been sort of a perennial challenge, I think, for, I don't know, so at least 50 years, maybe 60. I, I found some quotes from Eisenhower and John F. Kennedy complaining about ally burden sharing when I wrote an article about this. All right, I've got an interesting question from the audience. Jennifer from Washington, D.C., the 2006 NSS gave us the 3D framework, defense, diplomacy, and development. Most often we hear about the first two and less on development. With Samantha Power, uh, Ambassador Samantha Power elevated to the Principals Committee at the, or on the, at the, or the National Security Council, has seated at the National Security Council as U.S. aid administrator. How should the national security strategy reinforce this more comprehensive approach and highlight its utility and benefits? I would add in this context development, but I think we could think about development slash democracy, if you will, support, supporting dem democratic, de democratic values in government, if you will. Anyone want to take this on? Jim Steinberg, why don't I start with you? Well, it's a great question and it's a very important focus. I do think that, you know, it has been sort of a, a tenet of American foreign policy for a long time that we do have a stake in the prosperity, well being, the health of people around the world, and that, it, that even though they're far away and they're not here in this country, that it does come back and touch us. And we've seen this with issues of public health, for example, you know, where, where public health problems because of inadequate health infrastructure and faraway places come back and affects us. Uh, we see this uh, on issues of, uh, of conflict, which can come back and affect us. So I do think we have a stake there. I think we have to bring a 21st century perspective to this, which is that there's a limit to what government can do. I mean, we have our traditional foreign aid programs and they're valuable, uh, technical assistance programs and the like. But a lot of what goes into development is helping countries grow and prosper economically, which means having good trade policies that allow them to have an opportunity to develop their own uh, economic capabilities for them to buy our goods and for, for us to be able to buy theirs. Um, it's uh, having effective governance, right? A lot of the things that goes into development is having effective governance and that's where the democracy part comes in and working with countries to develop and strengthen their institutions. This is another area we're working with our allies is very attractive because it's a shared interest that we have with Europeans and Japanese and Koreans and others. Um, but if we're able to do this together, it seems less like an American project and part of the competition with China and more just because we see this as being in our interest. So I think the, the question is a good one to not lose sight of how important democracy and development is to our long-term national security strategy and our economic strategy. Uh, and to think about you know, creative ways involving the private sector, civil society, and our partners uh, as a way of trying to, to boost economic growth, public health and the like uh, in developing countries. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Um, I'll just add. I, uh, you know, agree with much of what Jim said, especially the allies part. This would be perfect examples of of working with allies who have different sets of capabilities. They have different comparative advantages in these areas, and 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 working with them. So we're not all uh, trying to do the same thing. Um, I mean, over <laughs> the same thing where there are lots of problems in these places. But overall development, I would I would say to uh, Dr. Powers that it's in a, it takes place in a competitive context. And this is not at all the way the traditional aid community thinks. 
Um, if they did, I think there's an opportunity for the Biden administration and for her specifically, because she's been, you know, she knows this field so well. What kind of information do you need? And are you getting it on the ground? At the local level, where are the competitions taking place? At the geostrategic level, where are the competitions taking place? Um, we have attended, you know, what are our priorities? What are our choices? And what are our theories of change and development? Right, we tend to do the same thing over and over year after year. Well, Myanmar, hundreds of hundreds of millions of dollars, or at least over a hundred million dollars in aid from the United States government, AID, and it hasn't been a success. We need to understand why. Right, we need to understand um, how we update our mode. So, in that sense, you know, I, I I very much agree with with Jim. But it's fundamentally, it too is a competitive domain. Yeah, I, 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 I let me just comment on that myself and just say that I think we're we're not the only game in town anymore. The Western form of development is, there's now great power competition has come to global development. And if we don't meet the hopes and aspirations of developing countries, they can take their business to China. Uh, not in every area, but that, you know, that they've, they've got, they've, there's some of that or, you know, so I think the other thing is you've seen it with the uptake in terms of the membership of AIIB, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. They I think they got something like 80 members in, in some, unbelievably short amount of time uh, because I think they spoke to the hopes and aspirations of developing countries. And so I think it, it does behoove us to think about what it, what are we offering and do we need to kind of revisit the offer that we're making? And also, uh, so I think these are these are good points. Seth? Yeah, just briefly, I mean, it is worth noting just to, just to talk specifically about it is China's broader development uh, sits generally under its Belt and Road Initiative which is not just about development either. It is, they have used it as a tool for promoting Chinese interests uh, where they have, where they have, uh, where they have uh, economic interests at stake and, and money that's been used. Now that as, as one of our CS, CSIS colleagues has written in a, in a recent book, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative has had a, some serious challenges. It's not, it doesn't appear to be very economically productive. It's led to backlashes in some areas. So it's you know there there it, it's it is not a clear uh, productive model for how you compete, but I do think it's worth ending on a recognition that when it comes to you know how much money the U.S. is putting into various agencies, everything still dwarfs the Department of Defense, and I do think it is worth asking ourselves what is the there may not be a clear answer. State Department's budget is roughly. 13 times smaller than the Department of Defense's. What, what, you, you know, why, why is that? It, it doubled under the Reagan administration. State Department's budget doubled under the Reagan administration because they wanted to push out uh, the importance of uh, diplomatic efforts. So I, I, what I'd like to see as part of the actual, the, the real national security strategy is what, what are the efforts we're putting into some of these as part of a broader strategy. And I, I think it is not just, it's not just defense. Look, we've got two minutes. I would like to give Jim and Nadia a minute on closing thoughts of each a minute, if you want to just give a parting thought. Jim, why don't I start with you? All right, so I guess, you know, we are talking about great necessary challenges, but I want to come back to the home front, which is that you know, we've, we've in the past overstated the bipartisan consensus and uh, politics stops at the water's edge um, side of American foreign policy. But I do think in the long term, one of the biggest challenges we have is the, is the inability to sort of sustain policy over an extended period of time. And I know that, that President Biden has got strong interest in trying to figure out ways to reach across the aisle, but it is, it's obviously troubling in any dimension, but in foreign policy, I think, you know, one of my greatest challenge would be to the Congress to try to find ways to come together to find uh, some cross aisle consensus about policy and then to work with the Biden administration. Because I think this is really, you know, we need to show ourselves in the world that this is, that there are some things that we can come around on and that everything is not just about the politics, but that there are some principles of our foreign policy that we agree on. Now, I think there's some evidence that this is happening. We certainly see more convergence on China, for example, than, than uh, we have on many issues in the past. But I think it will be important for the Biden administration to be successful to be able to find a way to work with the Congress and for the members of the Congress on both sides of the aisle to see, to try to find ways to build that coalition that can support sustained US efforts abroad. Okay, Nadia, I'll give you the last word. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick, so we'll end on time. I agree with Jim. I think the Biden administration needs to take a leadership role in working with both sides of the aisle in Congress, and it has to do so in good faith and in a spirit of national rejuvenation, which will require uh, agreement and compromises on both sides of the aisle. So I do think I do think that that's uh, that's very important. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. I want to thank Jim and Nadia. Seth, thanks for partnering with me on this. Um, this has been great. Really appreciate it. And uh, uh, this will be on YouTube shortly. And uh, thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in today.